Hello and welcome to Awk Hack the Planet's Text. This has been uh, updated for 2023. My name is Ben Porter. This is a presentation I originally did a few years ago for Linux Fest Northwest, and um, it's it's always been pretty popular, much to my surprise. But uh, I'm I'm glad. I'm very glad it's helpful to people. So uh, this is a re-recording uh, with some updated content, but it's mostly the same content. Uh, I've added some syntax highlighting and reordered a couple of slides that were kind of awkwardly ordered. And uh, this time, hopefully there won't be any video tearing. So without any further ado, let's get right to it. Here's a look of what we're going to cover today. So the first thing we'll do is we'll talk about what awk actually is, uh, and then we'll talk about why you would want to learn awk. And uh, then because I, uh, I like history, but I also find that understanding the history behind things helps me to understand decisions that were made, particularly engineering decisions. Uh, so we're going to talk briefly about the history of awk. Uh, then we'll take a look at some super simple awk programs. And then we'll dive deeper into what awk patterns are, and then deeper into awk actions. And then we'll dive even a little deeper still, and we'll cover functions and pipes and that sort of thing. And then lastly, we'll take a look at a bunch of example programs. Personally, I find that example programs help me to learn, you know, sometimes a concrete example for me is is what makes it very clear. So I try to include quite a few of those. So let's uh, let's get going. So what is awk? Said more simply, awk is uh, basically a domain-specific language, or DSL, that focuses on text processing. The reason for this is that a, a huge number of problems that we face are really just text processing problems. So it's it's a language that is perfectly tuned to run text transformation. It was written by Alfred Aho, Peter Weinberger, and Brian Kernigan, and that is the uh, Kernigan from the C fame. And uh, it was initially developed in 1977. In 85 to 88, Awk was significantly revised and expanded, and it was more or less rewritten into GNU Awk. So GNU Awk, which is often abbreviated just GOK, was written by Paul Rubin, Jay Fenlison, and Richard Stallman. And Gawk is today the most widely deployed version. It has been solely maintained by Arnold Robbins since 1994. And actually, in the last couple of years, Auk has gotten some new features. So it's uh, it's not just purely un in maintenance mode. Brian Kernigan actually wrote a new version of Auk as well that was first released in 1993. And uh, that is usually called Knock or New Auk. And this is useful to know because many of the BSD systems will actually ship NOC because they try to avoid the GPL license. Most Linux distributions and uh, most installations generally will install GOK, but uh, there are also a couple of other versions such as uh, one implemented in or BusyBox. And uh, sometimes the sometimes your AUK may be slightly different. Uh, there is a POSIX standard around it, but still uh, it's, it's not a terrible idea to know which version of awk you are targeting. So the big question that often comes up and can indeed spark philosophical debates, is awk a programming language? Well, uh, awk is definitely a command line tool, but it's a lot more so than like grep and others that it's, it's often uh, kind of compared to. It's not, we know it's not necessarily a general purpose language because it's optimized for text processing, but it is Turing complete and it does have all of the mechanisms that you need. So I would personally say, yes, Awk is a programming language and I think it's one of the best personally. Uh, but you can also think of it as a CLI tool. The majority of Awk scripts that I've seen in the wild are typically one liners. So they are more like command lines, but there's definitely complex Awk scripts that, that exist and that can be written. And we'll be taking a look at quite a few of those. So uh, in my opinion, the answer to this question is yes, Awk is a programming language, but uh, it's not necessarily wrong to think about it as uh, more of a CLI tool. So why learn Awk? You may already have an answer to this question since you're here, but um, this is an important question and, and one that I think is worth spending a little bit of time on. Uh, in my opinion, there are many good reasons for learning Awk. The, uh, the first one I put down here is uh, Awk is a part of POSIX, so it is installed absolutely everywhere. You know, I've got like a, a super old router that's got some ancient firmware on it. And I was SSHing into it the other day. And I 
ran into a need where it's like, man, yeah, I really wish, you know, I want to use awk here. And awk was there, you know, like a lot of the, a lot of embedded firmware will even include awk. And you'd be amazed at how often it is and how far it is everywhere. Uh, the next one is that many of the problems that you are facing today and that I face are often text processing problems. When, when you sit and think about how often the thing we're trying to do is to take some sort of text and transform it into some other other thing, it, it's incredible how often those how often those are the problems that we're trying to solve. And awk is obviously uh, really optimized for dealing with that. Uh, so in my opinion, awk is the gold standard of text processing tools. Now there there's there certainly are some modern tool sets that are very very useful, uh, and often those are actually inspired by awk which we'll talk about in a moment, but uh, you know, like Perl, uh, Ruby. Uh, but awk is, again, everywhere. And uh, it's it's sort of like the uh, the least common multiple. So uh, if, if you know awk, it's, it's fairly easy to do and it works everywhere. Uh, and that next reason is awk will make you powerful. You'd be amazed at what you could do with just a little bit of awk code. And uh, people are often impressed with those that use awk. And of course, all real hackers do use awk. Uh, but also, awk is actually pretty easy to learn. Seriously, you know, it, the syntax can look a little weird, but once you understand it, it's really quite simple and uh, very powerful. So it's it's worth it's worth it. You know, when when you get done with this video, you're going to know awk pretty well. So it's it's worth taking a little bit of time. So the history of awk. So before awk. There was a tool called SED, which is still used quite often. You've no doubt seen it. And that was actually the scripting part of ED, which was an early Unix text editor. SED was the first powerful regular expression-based tool. And it was, uh, it was often used with a main loop and then current line variables, which you could then do things with. And awk expanded on this. So awk was kind of an evolution in SED's line-oriented approach. And that kind of shows, uh, you know, as we're looking at things, you'll kind of see that nearly anything you can use SED for, you could also use awk for, and rather easily. So when comparing to SED, there's there's a lot that awk has in common. Awk, it's old enough now that it, there's a decent amount of history to look at. And awk's powerful regular expressions, and also some of its limitations, inspired other languages like Perl. Perl has a remarkable and still widely used string processing function to it that is still used today. In fact, if you look up Perl Pi or you know one-liners in Perl, then you can see that it's still ex extremely useful. Perl in turn inspired beautiful languages like Ruby, which is one of my favorites, and that inspired Elixir, which is also one of my favorites. So uh, even if we don't use awk actively, there's a lot to appreciate that awk gave us and look at the history for. It is customary to look at a hello world program anytime you're loading a new programming language. So uh, here it is. This is kind of a traditional hello world written in awk. Again, you know, don't worry about understanding this yet. You will understand this all in not that long, but uh, at the moment, this is just a hello world. So we're gonna get into better details here in a minute. So running an awk program, there are several different ways that you can invoke an awk program. And none of them are necessarily better or worse than others. They're just just different, and you'll probably use all of them. Uh, the first one uh, I've got at the top here is where essentially where where you see that string program, that's where the awk code goes. So uh, in in that first example, you're going to pat you know call awk, and then you're going to pass a big string that has all of the awk code and statements in it, and then uh, after that, you'll pass the input files, and awk will read those files and process it line by line and run it through your awk code. The second line, if, uh, if you have an awk program that's more substantial, then you may want to put it in its own file and then invoke it that way. And so for that, there is a dash F flag. So you can uh, invoke it that way and then pass in the input files the same way. You can also pipe to awk. Awk is a well-behaved Unix program. So it will if it, if it doesn't receive files or if it's if it's receiving input on standard in it will process that instead of looking for file arguments so you can pipe to awk and it plays very very well in the unix pipe system so very useful for that 
you can also even use a shebang style, uh, like a, a Unix type script. So uh, here's an example uh, for you. So you, you put your shebang there and you'll invoke awk and you pass it that dash F flag. Uh, that tells it to receive the uh, argument. The first argument will be a file and that will be containing the code. And uh, when this gets invoked, it will basically pass itself in. And so that's how it would work. And uh, that bottom line there is an example of how you would invoke it. So script.awk would contain the code in the second bullet and uh, star.log would be some collection of log files that we're trying to process against it. And this is how we would invoke it. So not too terrible. And if, if you're familiar already with command line stuff in bash, this should look completely normal to you. So let's talk about the structure of an awk program. We're going to um, we're going to go forward a little bit and then step back a little bit and then forward a little bit. So if if you're not getting this right away, don't uh, don't panic because we're gonna we're gonna cover it a couple different ways. But I want to talk briefly about the structure of an awk program. So the basic approach that awk takes is that each line. So if if you're passing it in as like a string on the command line, you can just think of it as a you know, single statement. Uh, each line in the input, so if the input is a file or if it's coming from standard in, it's processed in a line style similar to set. And each line that comes in is run against each line of awk code. And each line of awk code will have a pattern and an action. Now, that's not entirely true because sometimes they won't have both a pattern and an action. And in that case, there are defaults. So Internally, awk will always have a pattern and an action. If you don't specify the pattern, it's gonna just be a match all. So basically every single line on the input will have the action applied to it. And if you don't specify the action, then the default action is to just print the entire input line. And uh, we'll look at that again in a bit. But uh, So basically when you're, when you're thinking about the structure and execution of an awk program, you're going to look at each line of awk code will be structured this way, pattern and action, and you know terminated with either a new line or a semicolon, and uh, much like C. And you're also actually going to see, you know, C and awk were uh, co-residents. So there's a lot of inspiration there. That uh, awk is almost like a scripting language type version of C. Uh, but so each line of awk code comes in, and uh, awk will do its evaluation. It will take that line and it'll say, does this pattern match? And if the pattern does match, then it will execute the specified action. If the pattern does not match, it'll just go to the next line and then reevaluate. So it's a, it's a nice uh, read eval print loop type, type thing. And um, that's really as uh, complex as it gets. For those of you who are more uh, reading oriented, here's a more written explanation of what I just said. And some of these slides in here, I'm going to brush over pretty quickly as they're more intended for reaching people multiple mediums. So not everybody likes videos. So I wanted the slides to be useful if all you're looking at is just the slides. So uh, there's gonna be a few slides like that here and I'll move through them in the video. Um, but then some of them are also just reference sheets because I've heard people say that they like to keep the slides handy while they're working, while they're writing op programs and then just kind of look at some of the some of the slides for reference. So um, it's uh, my attempt to basically work for all workflows uh, might, makes it a little bit more awkward in the video form. But, uh, but yeah, so don't worry too much about that. Uh, so I kind of already mentioned this, but it's worth repeating because I've seen it be so confusing to people. Either the pattern or the action in each line of awk code can be omitted. And if the pattern is omitted, then every line will automatically match. So if it, uh, that first code example is essentially what is the equivalent. So if you don't specify the pattern, then uh, you're basically just getting that action. And if the action is omitted, then every line matching the regular expression will be printed. So if you think <laughs> with, you know, Oct's normal behavior is basically just cat. Yes, that's, that's right. So, um, you know, you could very easily re-implement cat in awk, but uh, that would be kind of pointless. But um, it's important to remember that because uh, when you see these things, the, the curly braces will cue you in that this is an action block. And if you don't see a curly braces on a particular line, then know that that action for that line is going to be to just print everything in the line. 
And if you don't see any sort of input test, then you know that it's going to match every single line. Now we're going to dive a little bit more into patterns. So we just talked about uh, patterns and actions and kind of how they work, but we don't really know what to do with them or you know how they work at all yet. So that's what we're going to cover now in, uh, in more depth. So patterns. So again, this is we're, we're now talking about that first part. So if, if we go back, we're, we're talking about that, that, that yellow block there, the middle one that says pattern matches. That's the portion that we're looking at right now. And it's basically just an if statement, if you're used to other programming languages. It's basically just like an if statement whose sole purpose is to evaluate to a Boolean result, either true or false. And if it evaluates to true, then we're going to execute the corresponding action. If it evaluates to false, then we're not going to run the action. We're just gonna go grab the next line and rerun everything again until we've processed all of our input lines. So as we're talking about patterns here, that's where it fits in. Here's a, a big list of basically the different types of patterns. Don't let this confuse you too much. We'll look at some, uh, some examples here too, but uh, the first one is a begin. If you've used Perl or even uh, some of the classic Ruby, then you may have seen this type of thing before, but essentially the keyword begin with all caps, and that's the entire pattern, that basically just is a special statement that will always run one time at the beginning. So before any of the lines on the input are processed, awk will execute this begin statement. And same with end, it's just basically the symmetrical result of that. These, this begin and end can be used for, for doing things that would otherwise be very difficult in a line oriented program. So for example, if you have some sort of initialization code that you need to run, then you could run that in a begin action block. And if you wanna say summarize the results of your program, so you know, say you're processing all these lines and you wanna sum up, maybe you're processing a bunch of lines that have payroll data. That's a foreshadow to the exercises. Then you may wanna add up the results for how much total payroll cost. You know, it's useful to have the data for how much each individual paycheck was, but it's also useful to see what's it gonna take out of the bank account. So uh, that's, that's, that's something you could use the end pattern for. Three, expression statements. So these are very simple statements that read a whole lot like C, and they've got a system of operators, which we'll be looking at in the next slide, but uh, they basically just evaluate some set expression. And if it's non-zero or non-null, then we'll say it's true and we'll execute the action. Otherwise we will not. Line four is what is the most common in my experience. Everybody writes awk differently. so. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to speak for anyone besides myself, but um, the regular expression is where the real power of awk comes in. And it's the one, it's the, the use case that I see the most. And it's essentially uh, the syntax, if you're familiar with Perl or Ruby again, or JavaScript now has the same syntax since ES6 or something. Basically, a regular expression literal can appear between these slashes. So you've got slash and then some regular expression, and then a closing slash. And awk supports that. Compound patterns, worth mentioning, these are not entirely different than the number three expressions, but compound patterns, basically the, the point here is that you can use the and, the or, and the not, you know, like ampersand, ampersand, pipe, pipe, or bang. You can use those to create pretty sophisticated expressions that will evaluate whether or not to run the action on that pattern. So it can be very powerful. The last one we'll mention on line six here is a range pattern. The basic idea is that sometimes you may want to only operate on a subset of the lines that are in the input. And if that is the case, then you can actually have two separate patterns that are basically like on and off switches. So basically when the first pattern becomes true, the action will be executed until the second pattern becomes true. And we'll, we'll look at some concrete examples of that. So don't worry too much about it, but it's very powerful. I mentioned the expressions and here you can see some of the different operators that are available. They probably look perfectly familiar to you if you have ever used another programming language 
I put some examples on the right and we are using a few variables there. I tried to structure those examples to expose you to as many different types of expression as I could think of, but don't worry too much about the, the variables like NF and NR. Those are special variables that awk makes available to your code, which are the number of fields in the input line and the number of records in the input, that sort of thing. It can be very useful. And then those variables like dollar sign one, dollar sign four, we'll talk more about those as well, but those are essentially columns, if you wanna think about them, in the particular line that you're processing or field would be the, the awk term for that. So like dollar sign one would be the first field, dollar sign four would be the fourth field, et cetera. String matching patterns are pretty common, as you can imagine, in a language that is made for string processing. Uh, so we're gonna look at specifically some of these string matching patterns in more depth. So we already talked about the regular expression. So the, you know, slash, regular expression slash. So it's worth mentioning that when you see that by itself, so just a regular expression with no other expression in it, that's perfectly valid awk, but it essentially implies dollar sign zero with a regular expression thing. So that, that tilde, this like squiggly line thing, that is uh, how you would compare to a regular expression. So if you look at line two, for example, that expression could be any valid expression. So it could be a constant, it could be a string constant NO, or it could be a literal number, it could, you know, 12, anything. And then the tilde means that you're comparing that to a regular expression. So it's a lot more commonly used with a variable like a field. So like if the first field or first column in the input matches some regular expression, so that would be dollar sign one, tilde, regular expression. That's really uh, much more common. But if you don't see the left half of that, then just know that we're implying dollar sign zero or the entire input line. Number three, is a good example of how you can do negative regular expressions. So this would be like a grep dash V. Basically you're saying, if it matches this regular expression, then do not execute the action. Any, and any expression, by the way, can be used in place of, of that, the regular expression with the tilde and the bang tilde. So there are a number of escape sequences. You may not use these too much anymore, but it's still worth knowing that they exist. Here's a quick table that kind of shows them. They're fairly standard, you know, uh, backslash N, backslash T are the ones you'll probably see the most or new line and tab, but these other ones do exist. So let's talk a little bit deeper on range patterns because those can be confusing. A range pattern is essentially two patterns that are separated by a comma. And a range pattern, think about it like the on and the off switch. When the first pattern becomes true, it will start the execution of every line until the second pattern becomes true, at which point it will turn off. So the first pattern turns the switch on, the second pattern turns the switch off. In this example at the bottom, we're basically just printing every line between one and 10. So again, print dollar sign zero, that just prints the entire line. And NR is that magic variable that is the number of records that have been processed so far. And awk will populate that for us. So when we see nr equals equals one, it's basically saying if the number of record is one, then turn the switch on, print the line. And number of record now is two. So the second pattern has not yet begin, been true. So we're still on, we keep going. Once we hit the 10th record, awk will set nr to 10. And our pattern on the, the second pattern on the right will pass and it will turn the switch off. And this script will be done processing at that point. So it basically just prints lines one through 10. Here's a handy uh, pattern summary table that I like. So you can see the begin and the end. Uh, there's nothing new here. This is just a, a summary for a reference, but uh, the begin and the end, and then an expression example and a string matching example and a compound example, and also a range example. So. Uh, those can be useful to you. I This is actually uh, an accident. <laughs> this slide is not supposed to appear in this spot, but uh, you know it might be a fortunate accident because this might be a good time to remind of what we said earlier. Either the pattern or the action can be omitted. If you don't see a pattern 
Like, for example, if all you see is a couple of uh, curly braces, then that is the default pattern, which matches every line. It's essentially the equivalent of that, uh, that first example there. The action can also be omitted. We're going to dive pretty deep on actions here in a moment, but that action can also be omitted. And in that case, the default action is to just print the entire line, basically, you know, print dollar sign zero. So you will see some aux scripts that are just a single regular expression. And that's perfectly valid and frankly, quite useful. It has a lot of overlap with grep. So most of the time I would probably use grep instead of awk, but uh, there's no reason that you would necessarily need to. They could both be perfectly expressive and perfectly useful. Okay, let's talk about awk actions. So uh, if we look back at our diagram here, now we're looking at the, the bottom piece or the green box where the action is actually executed. Again, uh, we take basically each line of awk code and uh, this diagram is showing the processing for each line of the input. And if the pattern matches, then we execute the action, which is specified inside those curly braces. And if the pattern does not match, then we go to the next line. So now we're gonna be talking about those specific actions. And there's a lot of stuff that we can do. As you can imagine, that's really where the, the meat of the program is going to be inside these action blocks. So some examples of what we can do, we can examine built-in variables. We can actually set our own variables. We can create new variables. We can even call functions. There's a lot of built-in functions like print, which are useful, but we can even define our own functions. And there's a lot we can do. One thing to note with these actions is that the parentheses in function calls are optional. So this is not some people's favorite feature and it's perfectly reasonable for you to have your own personal aux style to always have explicit parentheses. That's what I do. I am a Ruby fan and you know Ruby has the same feature, but I still will pretty much always have parentheses in my Ruby code because I find that it's a lot better. Now there are a few minor exceptions like the print function or the you know puts in Ruby. It's pretty obvious what's happening there. So sometimes I'll leave it out. So it's, it's kind of like a more shell style approach, but uh, for the most part, I'll, I'll throw those parentheses in, but you do you. And, uh, you know, just, uh, just keep in mind that those parentheses are optional. So uh, here's a list of some possible statements that we can include in actions. So these can be as long and complex as you want to make them. And I've seen some aux scripts that are like 25 lines long. And the first line is the pattern, which is a very simple pattern. And then the next 24 lines are basically just a pretty complex script. It's like something you would write in any programming language. So actions don't necessarily have a limit there. You can use expressions. So if you have a case where, you know, maybe you need, you need some sort of expression or syntax that is a little too difficult to stick in the pattern block, or maybe doesn't fit properly, you can use, you know, there's an if keyword and a while and a for and a do while and a break, continue next, exit, etc. Those keywords are all present in awk and you can use those in actions. So it's very conceivable. And I have seen poorly written awk programs that basically use the default pattern. And then it's just one giant long action in the script. And that action does a bunch of ifs and, you know, while loops and for loops and stuff. Now there are use cases for those loops. So don't think I'm bagging on them, but if you can do it with a pattern, it's usually better. Not always, but usually. So just be aware that there are lots of statements that actions can include. Now that we know a little bit about actions, let's take a look at some of the simplest awk programs. Almost everybody has probably seen the top example, especially if you've ever looked up, you know, how to do X on command line or how to do X on bash then you've probably seen the top one and there's no pattern in that example. It's just an action and it says print dollar sign two. So this is going to basically print the second column of whatever the input is or, you know, the second field to be, to use awk terminology. And that can be extremely useful. I, I use that multiple times every single day, not necessarily dollar sign two, but you know, whatever column, if you're parsing the output from some command line tool and you want to do something with, one particular column, either you want to extract it. Sometimes it's for a, a longer script that's doing something based on that. Like uh, just a few minutes ago, 
I deleted a bunch of Docker containers that were in a certain state and I used awk to grab the image ID. So there's a lot of stuff that's naturally in sort of a column format, which is just perfect for awk. So you've probably seen that before, but it's, it's very simple. It just prints the second column. So very useful. You also might have seen the bottom one. This one I don't this one I don't see nearly as it much, but I do see sometimes. And notice that's just a pattern. There's no action there. So that's going to be the default action, which is going to print the entire line. And that's just looking to see is the the value in the third field or third column, does that equal 10? And if it does, then it's going to print it out. Otherwise it won't. So it's it's like a it's basically like a, a grep. So here's a couple more simple awk programs. This uh, this one on the top is uh, is not very useful. It's for people who like to type for no reason, but it basically, since there's no pattern, it's going to match every single input line. And since it's just a print function and there's no argument there, it's going to use the implicit argument, which is dollar sign zero. So this awk program is basically just a re-implementation of cat, but it's useful to know this. And so I mentioned this because in awk, there's a lot of implicit stuff. So if you think about the time period when awk was developed, key presses could be expensive. Memory was limited, storage was limited. And in, in some cases you may have been sitting at a dumb terminal and you had to wait for an echo back for every single character you typed, you know, different, different things like that. And so for that reason, there's a lot of implicit behavior in awk. And that can be a trip for people that are just starting out, but it's important to know that it exists. So most modern awk programs do not use extreme implicit stuff anymore, but you might see one that does, and I don't want you to be super confused. So uh, that's why I put an example like this. Here's this top one. This example is going to basically just print columns one and three, or you know fields one and three. So that could be very useful depending on your input. But you know you could do a lot more in an action besides just print stuff. The example on the bottom does some column math. So in this case, we're gonna print dollar sign one. So the first field, so we would say that's somebody's name. So that's, that's like some string. It'll print out name and then dollar sign two times dollar sign three. Let's say that dollar sign two is the hourly wage and dollar sign three is how many hours that person worked that week. This will print out basically two values, two outputs. It'll be name and then total paycheck value. And the input data doesn't have to have that total paycheck value because you can very easily calculate it using awk. We need to talk about the built-in variables. I sometimes will call these magic variables, but these are variables that awk is going to make available to your code. Some of them you'll probably never use and others you'll probably use a lot. So let's talk about them and some of their defaults. And we'll go a little bit more in depth on some of these as well. So argc is a, is a pretty familiar one that's survived a, a, lot of, a lot of rebirths. Argc is the number of command line arguments. You can write command line tools in awk and you can process command line arguments and do interesting things from them. Argc will let you see how many command line arguments there are and argv will be an array of all of those command line arguments. So that can be useful. File name will always be the name of the current input file. So there is no default, as you noticed, if you're reading from standard in, there's not going to be a current input file. So if you're writing a good awk script that can behave properly, it should be able to function on both input streams or files. So you probably don't wanna be doing a whole lot with this variable, but it is there. FNR is the record number in the current file. NR, the very this one's a little bit lower, is the number of records read so far. So the difference between these two is uh, NR, which is used constantly, is how many records awk has read and processed so far. And a record is basically just a line of input text. Each record will basically increment that count. So you can see how much you've done. But sometimes you wanna know what number of record, like how many records have we processed in the current file. And if you need that, then FNR is your variable. FS, that's an important one. That controls the input field separator. When we're working with awk data, oftentimes our data is gonna look more like columns. Awk can be perfectly good at just, you know, stream line editing type stuff. 
but its real power comes through in its ability to work on fields at, or columns. FS, the input field separator, by default, it is just a space. And so basically any white space. In practice, um, sometimes they're tabs, sometimes they're multiple spaces, but awk will just do the right thing because uh, of this default value. But sometimes it's not. I, there are sometimes, in fact, a colon is not that uncommon. So sometimes I'll set FS to the colon, but the FS variable, you'll probably write to it actually more than you read from it because you can change it and you can change it dynamically as your script processes. So even if you have like the first hundred lines use white space and then all of a sudden it changes the commas or something crazy, <laughs> I don't know why you'd ever do that, but uh, you can actually account for that in awk because you could update the value of the FS variable so that it does the right thing. NF is the number of fields in the current record. And again, think record is like a line, column is like a field, that sort of thing. So number of fields in the current record. So this may change, but you can use this variable to do interesting and clever things, including adding columns. And there's a challenge problem where you'll actually need to add a column. So it'll be, uh, it'll be useful. OFMT, this is the output format for numbers. By the way, this slide will be super useful to you as you're writing awk programs. You definitely want to reference this slide because it'll be really, really helpful. So OFMT, output format for numbers. This is like a printf style. It's, it's made it into a lot of other languages. You can basically change the output format that numbers come out for uh, by default. So the output field separator or OFS by default is also a space. So we've got an input field separator, which is just FS. And then we've got an output field separator. And the input one is the one we mostly care about because that's what the input file uses. But when you're outputting lines, you can actually set your own field separator. So if you want like colons instead of spaces or dashes or something, that's very, very easy to do. And simply just setting OFS, like in a begin block, for example, will make that happen magically. Output record separator also. By default, it is the line feed. And usually, since each record is basically a line, normally you want there to be a line break between output records when you're printing them. So most of the time, you're not going to use, you're not going to change this value, but uh, you can. So you can change the output record separator. You could use anything. You know, in fact, like say you were processing a CSV and for some reason you wanted each column in the CSV to be pr processed as a separate record in awk, you could very easily do that. I was looking at a script the other day that did that exact thing. It took me a while to figure out what was going on, but, uh, but yeah, so it's very, very powerful. Our length, uh, variable, it's the length of string matched by the match function. So there's a match function, as you can tell, and uh, that's one of the many functions that are provided by awk that you can call in your code. And some of these variables, these variables will be set by awk as other things happen. So I'm a functional programming nerd. You know, ever since I got into Elixir, I, uh, I really appreciate a lot of functional programming concepts. And a huge one is not changing global state, <laughs> but uh, we, gotta, we gotta let it slide sometime. So, this is basically a side effect. So you call the match function and the match function will do its thing and it will return its value. But sometimes you want more than just the return value from the function. And in a purely functional language, that's a very, very difficult problem. But in a language like this, you know, you just change a global variable and uh, you're good to go. So um, that's some of these variables are essentially like that. RS, start. I guess uh, I won't read them all to you, but these variables can be very helpful depending on what you are doing. So here's some examples using these magic variables. So uh, in our awk script, say we wanted to print the number of fields or columns that are in each input line, then that top script will do it. The second one, uh, say we wanted to just print the number of lines that we've read as we go. So if you think about the output of this, we're basically, this small script on the bottom is basically adding line numbers, which is kind of cool. You know, it's, that's pretty useful. I, I actually have a, an alias for this in my bash RC file that I'll invoke sometimes. It'll just quickly add line numbers and that can be extremely helpful. It, uh, it may, looks, may look like a dumb script, but it's actually pretty helpful, so. Awk can also add text to the output 
So far, we've only looked at cases where we were printing existing data, you know, like taking variables and doing something to them. And we weren't really, like we weren't doing anything extra, but we absolutely can. We can use string literals, like this top example. We'll print the number of fields columns, but it will also add some text. So like if you think about our input again, dollar sign one, again, think dollar sign one is the person's name. And then dollar sign three is their hourly wage. Then you could write a very quick aux script one-liner that prints so-and-so makes X dollars per hour. And you've got it. One thing I, I intentionally, with this example, introduced you to another concept, and that is string concatenation in awk. The first thing is that the string concatenation is just a space, basically. There's no operator, like in a lot of languages, it would be a plus sign or a dot or something like that. In awk, it's just a space. So strings will be concatenated with that. And you may also notice that dollar sign one, we know is a string because it's person's name, but dollar sign three is probably a float or you know some sort of a number. And there's no sort of type coercion explicit in that awk will automatically do your type coercion for you. I'm gonna mention that again a little later in the slideshow, but uh, repetition is good because it will help you remember. So that's a couple things to keep in mind from that example. There is a printf function. So looking at the bottom example here, the printf function gives you a lot more control. If you're familiar with C or you know any of the, the, the similar implementations of this, then it probably looks very familiar to you. But essentially you use placeholders in the input string and then you can fill those in with variables. So you can get a lot more control with printf. Also worth considering too, is that you know, awk plays very, very nicely with Unix pipes. And for that reason, it should be praised. But here's some examples of how that can be useful. So you can actually, there are built-in functions inside of awk that do sort and unique and that sort of thing. But uh, I wanted to show this example of how it plays nice. So uh, this top example would be, you know, sort the output by a number of dollars per hour. So say the boss comes and he's like, hey, I wanna know who makes the most money in this company. So you grab the payroll data, it's a TSV file, like all good data should be. And uh, you crank it through here and you sort it and you grab the top one. The bottom one can filter on unique wages. So, you know, say you wanna remove duplicates and uh, just show each unique one, then uh, that bottom example could do that. Okay, so we're, uh, we're gonna now take a, a slight step back again and talk a little bit more in depth about expressions. I mentioned them before. So expressions can be in the pattern or the first part of the awk line, but they can also appear in the action block, like in an if statement. So we're gonna look at some expressions in a little bit more depth, but just remember that they can apply to either side. The point of expressions are to evaluate to some true or false, that sort of thing. So most of these are pretty self-explanatory and you've probably seen in many other languages. So we won't go through them all, but they essentially all the operators you're probably used to will apply. It used to be that everybody knew what prefix and postfix uh, plus plus and minus minus was. Nowadays, I don't think that's as, uh, as true as it used to be. So I will mention that one briefly. The plus plus and the minus minus are unary operators that will basically increment the value by up or down by one, depending on whether they're the plus plus will do by one, minus minus will do it down one. Prefix and postfix, basically, if you stick it on the beginning of the variable, then it will uh, evaluate it after the fact. And if you stick it on the end, it'll evaluate it uh, after the fact. But um, those are present in awk. As you've probably thought at some point during this, there's a lot of potential math that you can do on input data. That could be extremely useful. There are a bunch of built-in math functions that awk provides, and most of these are things you would expect. And again, you can write your own functions, so if you needed one that doesn't exist, you can write your own. But here's, a, here's an example of a bunch of, of built-in ones. Random numbers, sign, square roots, you know, seeding the random number generator, cosines, <laughs> exponents, that sort of thing. So it can be useful for your mathematical needs. So more commonly, you'll probably use these. Here's a list of some of the built-in string functions. G sub is very common, very familiar if you're a Ruby or Perl person. 
But the GSUB, basically global substitution. There are some minor differences with the way AUK deals with them. So it's worth looking. And importantly, there are implicit arguments involved in some of these string functions. So uh, some of them have both implicit and explicit versions. And the implicit version will operate on dollar sign zero or the entire line. And in my opinion, that is a pretty sensible default, even nowadays, because uh, most of the time you probably do want to just operate on dollar sign zero. Although I am more of an explicit over implicit kind of person. But anyway, there are different versions of that. So G sub for substituting. So you can substitute for uh, regular expressions, that sort of thing. You can grab substrings. You can do string splitting. You can grab the index of a particular character. You can, the match function, you can test whether there's a substring in R. It's, uh, it can be very useful. And sprintf or sprintf, if you know what that, what that is from C and from other languages, that's extremely helpful. Essentially, you can format things the same way that you would with a format string with like printf, but you can store the result in a variable. So you can do other things for it, which is, is very useful basic substitution and you know basic substring type stuff so can be very useful so this is another one of the slides that's kind of nice to have handy when you're writing awk programs here are some examples of string functions being used so i mentioned that uh, the implicit version of say g sub has a dollar sign zero being the whole line as the input so in uh, in this g sub example we're basically taking our regular expression is saying anywhere that USA, all caps with no space between, anywhere that that appears, we're going to replace it with the written out United States. And the print also has a default argument, which is dollar sign zero. So uh, G subs input argument is dollar sign zero. It's going to return something. And then print dollar sign zero is, uh, is going to print it out. So it looks pretty weird. And uh, it can be very confusing when you don't understand what's happening. But it's very useful. So there's another example on the bottom there. So we're actually using the sprintf function and we're assigning that to a variable. So as I mentioned before, you've got a format string there and we're formatting dollar sign one and dollar sign two and we're storing that variable and uh, we can then use that later in whatever we're doing, which is very useful. And then the G sub. So this is a G sub with a explicit argument. So you can see a uh, global substitution slash a n a basically anywhere that that regular expression matches we're going to replace with anda the input argument which is the third argument which may be a little bit backwards from what you're used to but it is what it is uh, is banana so basically that bottom line is just going to change the word banana to bandana wherever it appears so fairly uh, fairly straightforward but that's an example of the explicit arguments String concatenation. Again, I'm using repetition to help you remember this. This is the this is not the first time I've mentioned it, but if this is the first time you can remember, don't don't fret about it. But string concatenation is essentially putting two strings together. There's an example there: print dollar sign two, dollar sign three. Notice parentheses are missing because they're optional, but this is passing a single argument into the print function. So if if you were to just see this code completely out of context, I would guess that this is invoking the print command with two separate arguments. But in, in the case of Bach, it is not. It, it is going to concatenate $2 and $3 together. And then those will be the only argument that are passed to the print function. There's an example at the bottom as well. So we print hello world. There's a space between the two. But as you can see in the output, there is no space because those strings are concatenated directly together. So we could easily add a space there if we wanted to, but that example kind of demonstrates how the string concatenation works. So let's talk about some of the types. I, uh, I actually wondered if I should cover this earlier, maybe even like at the very beginning, and I decided not to because it just seemed a little overwhelming, but it is important to know. So we're, we're gonna cover that briefly. So awk is a very dynamic language. You don't specify types really ever, it's, uh, you know, it's interpreted, it's, it's very loose, but it does have types. Not many, but it does have some. There's strings and numbers are the big two. So you can see string literals are largely what you would expect. And then there's a bunch of different number types. 
I put the different types of numbers there to kind of demonstrate that there's a lot of different ways that you can write numbers in awk and they will all work. And another important thing to note is that awk will automatically coerce these types when they're needed. So you could pretty freely use these, which is very useful and feels remarkably modern. So here's a more of a reference slide with a bunch of expression operators. So um, we've covered these a few different times, but this is a kind of another useful way to look at them. So I wanted to uh, put this in there as well. So depending on what you are trying to do, assignment is pretty straightforward. You've got your logical operators and there's also an in keyword. So in is an operator in awk, which again, feels remarkably modern given its age and uh, it can be very useful. So uh, this is a good slide to keep handy while you are writing awk scripts. Control flow. So I mentioned that awk can be used essentially like a general purpose language that it's Turing complete. An important part of that is the control flow. So we've already mentioned that inside the action blocks, we can support if else and while and for. So this is not the first time that we've talked about this, but uh, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into it now and also look at some examples. These are very C-like. If you've ever done C or a C-like language, then these probably look familiar to you, but this slide can be very useful when you're trying to think about, you know, oh, what do I need? What should I do? If statements, pretty straightforward. You've got your while loops and for loops and uh, break, continue. So if you're inside of a loop and you wanna break or continue, then there's a keyword for that. And there's basically everything you need to manage the control flow. Oh, also there is exit as well. I mentioned that earlier, but I didn't talk about it. Exit can be very useful. Basically, if you hit some condition that you want to end or terminate at, then you can use the exit command and it will immediately go to the end action. If exit is used inside the end action, then the program will just exit right off, but it won't skip the end action. So that's very useful in my opinion. If in the body of your script, you detect some condition, say, oh, I don't, you know, we don't want to continue either some error condition or unsafe condition or something, then you can exit. And in your end block, you can gracefully exit, you know, tell the user what happened or whatever you need. So it's kind of like a, like a finally block in an exception catch. Here's a couple of control flow examples. The one on the left is a while loop and the one on the right is a for loop. So pretty straightforward. We're using the magic variable NF, which is number of fields in the line. So both of these are doing the same thing, but basically the loop is going through each column or each field in the line and printing it out on its own line. Uh, you can imagine why that would be useful. So there's our plus plus postfix operator, which uh, is just incrementing the variable. Output statements. Without the ability to generate output, it wouldn't be a very useful language. So it's worth looking at the different ways to do that in awk. Here's a useful slide. Obviously we've covered print and printf both. So this is more of a reference sheet, but you can actually open files with awk and you know read and write to from them. So that can be useful. And the system command can also execute basically any, any command, sort of like uh, the system call in C. You can basically run any sort of command, any sort of shell expression and uh, do something with the result of it. So that can be very useful. I've never seen it done. And if I was writing an awk script and I had a need for that, I'd probably question whether I was using the best approach, but it does exist and it's good to know about and it's uh, cool to have. Here's just a quick reference sheet for, for those using printf, the uh, format string. This is a quick reference of basically some of the main types of expressions and control characters that you would use. So you can see the, the S, the percent %S is extremely common as is percent %D, but there are some others. Okay, so at this point, you pretty much know just about everything, except for a couple of uh, interesting things. Like we haven't written any functions yet, and uh, we haven't really, we haven't done anything with files. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, the one on the top here, we can, this is how one way that we can write to files directly from awk. In this case, you know, we're just writing the expression into the file named file name. So it's not very useful, but you can see how it could be very useful. You could result in writing some data to a single file that's very useful for later processing, 
or you could write some data to a bunch of different files or basically whatever you needed. Awk also supports the pipe internally. So you can use the pipe operator inside of Awk as well as outside. That is something else that you may see. I have never used it personally inside of Awk. So I had a very difficult time coming up with an example, as you can probably tell, since I just wrote command, but it is possible. So it is something that you could see. We've mentioned the magic variables quite a bit. You can use those and Awk will set those for you. You can also write to the magic variables and those will typically do what you expect that it will do. Sometimes it's less intuitive, but sometimes that can be very useful. Like the field separator FS is one that I use that I write to on occasion, which uh, will change the field separator that's on the input from the default of space. I, it's usually I'm changing it to a colon or a comma, but anyway, you can set your own variables. So you can create and set arbitrary variables as long as it's not a keyword then you can set it. So in this case, we've got W and we're just doing the plus or equals NF. So we're basically adding up the total number of fields in every single record. And then C, we're calling the length function. So this is basically the length function here is being called with the implicit argument, which again is dollar sign zero. So we're getting basically the length of the entire input. We're adding one to it and we're storing it in a variable called C. Calling functions, we've already seen that a few times, but here's a, here's just another example that, uh, again, I, I mentioned I will overwhelm you with concrete examples because that's how I personally learn the best. So if you're feeling tired of this, don't feel like you gotta, you know, you can skip a minute. But uh, anyway, yeah, so this example, basically very similar to what we were doing before. We're counting the number of words in the input and printing the number of lines, words, and characters. So we're essentially implementing the WC command which can be surprisingly useful. As you can see in our normal action block, we are doing our counting. So we're like, we, we don't actually care to transform the input. We're basically just using the action block to keep track of internal data. And then inside of our end block, we just print our data out. So the, the number of records that we, re that we read, so that would be number of lines, like WC would put out, and number of words and number of characters. So can be very useful. we can define our own functions. So in this case, we're defining a function called add three. Personally, I find the syntax to be quite intuitive. So I was glad that it wasn't like weird somehow, but these functions can be called from other code. So if you notice, this function is called outside of a pattern and action block. So this function will be essentially evaluated and defined at the beginning of awk loading our stuff. So before any lines have been run from the input that this function will exist. And so we can call it immediately from any sort of actions. So in this case, where our input pattern matches, we're gonna invoke the add three function with a 36 and it'll output 39. So completely useless, but illustrative. Arrays, you don't get very far into most programming without running into arrays. So I definitely wanted to cover arrays in this presentation. There are a couple of important things to note for arrays in awk. First thing is arrays are one dimensional. You can hack together, you know, multi-dimensional arrays if you want, but they don't behave exactly like you would expect. And part of that is because arrays are all associative. If you're not familiar with an associative array, versus a normal array. Think about it, with a normal array, it's basically contiguous memory blocks that are offset by some, some value. So, you know, if you have a, an array that's got five members to it, then you've got five blocks right next to each other. And the index will be an integer value, which basically is used to calculate the memory offset. Associative arrays, on the other hand, are where the keys can be anything, really. Most commonly, they're strings. You probably also know them as like hash table or a hash map or a map or you know some, something like that, depending on what your preferred language calls it. But in awk, they're always associative. Now you can use them in a way that makes you really feel like they're standard arrays. You know, like you can use integers as the keys, as the example here shows, but it's actually still under the hood, it's still an associative array. So that is an important thing to keep in mind. Now, most of the time, 
you don't have to care because you can still use for loops and while loops and just count and use your you know math to get to the correct offset. That's still going to work, but uh, there are a couple of things to keep in mind with the fact that they are associative. It has some performance impacts. Sometimes it's better performance for you, and sometimes it may be worse. So it's uh, it's something to know if you're if you're doing like very serious programming. But if you need a raise, the in keyword makes it very easy to to go. The some of the examples I showed earlier were like using a for loop or a while loop and then counting up the index. You don't actually need to do that in awk. You can use the in keyword, and it's fairly nice syntax. So uh, that should be the preferred approach, but it is, it's very flexible. So you can also delete elements from the array with a delete keyword. And when you're setting or replacing an element, there's a couple examples there. Uh, so essentially it's the same syntax that most, most languages use. So your, your array is gonna be dereferenced with a square brackets and then inside will be the key. So we can set the array at one with the value two or at the you know array at the index five with the string two. So it uh, can be very useful. Field manipulation. So I mentioned this earlier that you can add fields dynamically and uh, otherwise manipulate them. And so we're going to go a little bit deeper on that as well. You can specify fields by expression. One of the things that comes up every so often is either you wanna reference the last field, and sometimes you may not know how many fields are gonna be in your input. That's more common than I wish it was. So if you wanna write a robust script, you can't assume there's always six columns or you know always eight columns or whatever. So a well-written robust script will handle a differing number of columns. So for that, you can use like this expression uh, with NF minus one. So that'll get you to you know, second to last, dollar sign NF will be the last, et cetera. So that can be very useful. Uh, at the bottom example, we this is where we're actually gonna add a field that doesn't exist. So we're dynamically adding another field at the end of each record that has whatever value we set it to. We're doing this with uh, the dollar sign in parentheses NF plus one. So we're basically saying the number of fields plus one. So if we knew there was always eight fields, we could use nine here. But again, that wouldn't, or dollar sign nine. But you know, again, that's it's not great practice. Uh, ideally, you would want to support arbitrary numbers of fields. So uh, this bottom example would be a better way to do it. And this is going to work, basically adding that input on no matter how many input fields there actually are. Self-contained scripts. I mentioned this before, but it can be very convenient to have a self-contained awk script. So this is an example of that. The script doesn't do anything useful, it just prints out each line, but it kind of shows you how it can be invoked. So this can be done. Okay, we are almost done. So <laughs> almost out of here. There's a couple of weird awk stuff that I wanted to cover. And this is the kind of stuff that I think gives awk a uh, reputation for being extremely cryptic because it, it really is pretty, pretty cryptic. Uh, so if you look at this top example, this is an example that I have seen in the wild a few different times. And I never knew what it was doing. And I, I tried to figure it out and eventually I did, but it was tough. Basically that top command is just removing the leading space. It's basically taking advantage of implicit behavior, which is why it was so perplexing to figure out how on earth it was doing anything. You know, it's, it's basically like dollar sign one equals dollar sign one, and then a one, uh, what on earth is that? So uh, one thing to note is that if you recall, our, our structure is pattern, action, pattern, action. So our action block in this case is before the pattern. So if you, if you notice in that top example, it's, um, it's actually action pattern instead of pattern action. So what that means is we've got some implicit stuff going on here. We've got an implicit pattern at the beginning, which matches every line. And then we've got our action. And then we've got another pattern. So there's, there's no semicolon required because after the action block closes with that curly brace, it's now the next line. So it's a pattern. So that the one on the right side is just a pattern. And uh, <laughs> that 
uh, that will match everything. And the default action for that line is to print everything out. A little easier to read version is, uh, is one at the bottom. And uh, now that I'm talking through the slide, I realize I probably should have written out one that does everything explicitly. I'll edit that in, <laughs> I'll edit that in, in a minute. But, uh, but yeah, so it, um, it's really not that, that bad. And it's actually pretty useful. And uh, I've got this as an alias now in my bash RC file is, again, and um, it could be very helpful. Ah, okay. It, it wouldn't be complete without this one too. This is a file server written completely in awk. If you recall, we can access a lot of functions and there's a lot of stuff available. So we can actually open a socket and reply to a server. So this is, it's just, it's just HTTP 1.0, but this is a, re a working file server that can just serve files for you. I, I actually, I haven't tested it recently. It's 2023 now, but uh, I tested it like five years ago, six years ago, something like that. And it worked <laughs> and uh, I was pretty blown away. So it was cool, but um, it's completely not useful. So don't even try to read it, but <laughs> just thought I'd throw it in there for some reason. Okay, so we're at the end of the first part, which is great. So um, there's a couple of references I wanted to point to. There is a book called The Awk Programming Language. It's by Aho and Kernigan and Weinberger. It is phenomenal. It's, it's, a, it's a terrific book. It's out of print, which is highly unfortunate. I bought a copy quite a few years ago and uh, I've been hoarding it because it's very, it's hard to find copies, but there are PDFs floating around the internet of this book as well that you can get. So uh, it's not terribly hard to find. At least it wasn't terribly hard to find the last time I looked for it a few years ago. Um, I would imagine the situation is not terribly different. So do look, it's worth finding. It's a great book. It's really small for what you would expect, but very to the point. Then there's also an OCK tutorial by Jonathan Plarty that I found very interesting and helpful. So uh, that's a reference on there too. And also the Wikipedia page for Auk is really good. So it's uh, it's definitely worth looking at. Part two is going to be uh, these challenges. So I'm going to end this video and we'll pick it up at part two, but we're done with basically the, the academic presentation. If you want to do the challenges, which I highly encourage you to, it's a chance to basically put into, uh, into you action all the stuff we used. Uh, we've got a challenge scenario and I found it to be kind of fun. Maybe it's too much like work for you, but definitely uh, recommend checking that out if you want to. And thank you for watching.